Welcome, everyone. Um, it's about one o'clock after one, so we're going to get started. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to the latest edition of the webinar series of the Disaster Management and Resilience Program at H of HCELAC. Uh, as you may know, this is a semi-monthly series in which we invite notable practitioners and scholars in the emergency management and disaster studies fields to share their insights and experiences. Um, and my name is Jason Bernowski. I'm one of the associate program directors within the Disaster Management and Resilience Program, and I'll be moderating today's event. So we're thrilled to welcome today uh, Mark Gillarducci, the director of the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Uh, director Gillarducci has been working in emergency management for more than 30 years, holding positions ranging from the state fire chief to a federal coordinating officer at FEMA. Um, in his current position, he was appointed into in 2013 by Governor Brown uh, as director of the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, Cal OES, and Governor Newsom reappointed him to this position in 2019. So during his time in public service, uh, Director Gilarducci has encountered nearly every hazard imaginable and participated in numerous historic events. Um, in 1996, for example, he led the search uh, for victims and survivors of the Oklahoma City bombing. He also served as an advisor to the, uh, the governor of Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And in his role in California, he's overseen numerous wildfires, such as the 2018 campfire, who provided briefings to uh, our uh, most recent three presidents, Obama, Trump, and Biden. Um, and then obviously, he's also played a, a key role in the state's response to COVID. And I suspect he also has some observations about earthquake preparedness, among other things. Um, so before I turn to Director Garladucci uh, to, um, to offer his remarks, I'd like to offer just a quick word in format. So the director will uh, be speaking for about 25 to 30 minutes. Once he's done, I'll kick off the discussion with a few questions before taking questions from the audience. Um, for those of you that has questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A function and then I can kind of ask them for you. Um, so with that, uh, let's everyone please welcome Director Gorducci. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jason, and, and, and greetings to all. Happy to be with you today and get a chance to talk a little about um, emergency management and, and you know, kind of in the context of what we've had to deal with here in California um, and uh, over the course of the last several several years, um, which I would just say, you know, arguably have been unprecedented. Uh, I, I was appointed, as Jason mentioned, in 2013 and early, early on, uh, following my appointment, we started to really started to see uh, the early impacts of climate change and, the, and how climate was affecting um, the state. And which this, this, these series of events would take hold and, and would really frame how the state would be impacted by a series of disasters over the course of the next many years, um, the next 10, 15 years. And really what, you know, much of the climate scientists have talked about, you know, we were starting to see firsthand here. And it, and it really started with um, two things that, that, uh, uh, that we, we saw impacted us. First was, uh, um, uh, the beginning of a pretty significant drought, which ended up lasting initially for about close to four and a half or five years. Uh, but with that came conditions that uh, exasperated and, and um, accelerated, I should say, um, issues like wildfire. Uh, we began then a journey of, of wildfires occurring in California, one uh, more uh, extensive, more complex, more catastrophic than the previous and uh, and that really started to frame um, how we were having to deal with it made us really look at all of the different kinds of emergency management principles that we had um, historically California is a disaster prone state we have had uh, you know fires for a long time it's not the first time we started having wildfires but it's the first time we started having wildfires at the, in the extreme uh, that we were seeing I'll talk about that in a minute. California is a disaster prone state. So we have earthquakes, um, um, we have floods. Uh, in fact, uh, we're, we're rated high on uh, flood potential scale outside of the central part of the United States. Uh, places like the Sacramento Central Valley of California rate uh, number like two and three for uh, potential for flooding and, and uh, catastrophic flooding. Um, you know, we have, uh, um, uh, you know, different kinds of environmental impact um, uh, disasters. We have huge agriculture here in California, so impacts to our crops, et cetera. So fires, earthquakes, floods. Uh, and then of course, California, you know, is just, a, it's, a, it's a unique unique place. It's a very large, you know, one, many, many people call it a nation state, you know, 40 million people, uh, uh, international border, uh, which uh, 
which arguably has, you know, the largest amount of border crossings um, in the United States through the San Jose Report of Entry in San Diego County. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute as well, because that's a whole nother operational construct and dynamic that we have been dealing with along the Southwest border. And, um, uh, and, and a critical infrastructure that's throughout the state that is uh, significant, very powerful, very important for the, for the GDP of the country, right? Not, not, notwithstanding the port, the ports of LA and Long Beach uh, uh, and Oakland, but most of the port of LA and Long Beach, which moves commodities across the United States from the Pacific Rim, uh, the critical nature of that and, and the ability to have a pipeline and, and an infrastructure that moves those commodities to other parts of the country. Um, and we saw a little bit of the, the bobble of that during the COVID about how, how that, uh, that it can be impacting to the rest of the country with regards to supply chain. Um, to, um, to things like Silicon Valley, where the, there's innovation in, in, uh, in the technology space and the ability to uh, drive technology and provide uh, technology solutions for not just across the country, but around the world. So the significance of California is, is, is pretty important. And uh, that, of course, a lot of that falls here at the Office of Emergency Services with regards to our level of being prepared and um, ability to anticipate and respond uh, to these kinds of things. Um, in fact, over the last 10 years, uh, we, we ended up have, have now experienced the worst drought in 1200 years in California, right? That's had a lot of cascading impacts. Um, we had to manage a you know, generational pandemic like everybody else across the world, right? We've had multiple back-to-back -back catastrophic wildfires, 15 of the most destructive fires in the state's history actually have occurred since 2015, seven of which occurred just in the last two years alone. Right, so conditions continue to get worse. Um, we've seen that cascading into our power grid. Uh, we've seen an, an, an increase in the number of outages that we've we've had the impact on the power uh, supply system. Um, of course, we we still have had earthquakes. Uh, knock on wood, uh, we have not had the catastrophic earthquake, and that is the one thing that we spend a lot of time on preparing. It's worst case scenario, highest impact, highest consequence event. Um, and, but we've had a lot of mid range and even, you know, we had a 7.1, um, uh, luckily it was not in that populated of an area and we were able to navigate through that, but we know that the big earthquake, uh, is coming. Um, you know, we certainly have also had intense storms and, you know, that ha are, have been very sporadic and targeted. So it's not like, well, you know, they had a storm and a flood that droughts over, uh, no, it, it, uh, it, it's, um, it, it, it gives us a, a very small time frame of, of um, precipitation, not enough to end the drought, but it comes in such a way through an atmospheric river sort of concept that actually ends up um, impacting uh, critical infrastructure breaking down. We've had the loss of a major spillway at the world's largest dam in Orville. Uh, the Orville uh, Dam spillway collapsed um, as a result of one of these micro atmospheric river events. Um, and then of course, uh, throughout the process, you know, uh, 2020, for example, we had, um, uh, we were deep in the response to COVID. Uh, we had uh, at least something like 20 different wildfires that were burning throughout the state, very significant. And we had civil unrest from the end of the, the, the Southern California all the way up to Northern California that we had to manage. All of these have been uh, an ongoing challenge. And it, it's resulted in us um, having to continually reevaluate and um, understand uh, principles and concepts uh, in emergency management, right? So we have literally had to transform uh, over the last 10 years what uh, emergency management looks like, how we um, do situational awareness, um, how we lean forward. Uh, the old adage that you know, the levels of government sort of wait, you wait until the phone rings when, you know, at the state level, when local government gets in trouble, then, you know, or they need assistance, they make a telephone call and they request assistance from the state. Those days are really over. This is really in a one team, one fight effort. We're all integrated now that that collaborative, um, uh, interactive situational awareness uh, uh, incident 
forecasting, uh, the ability to share information in a timely way in advance of a potential, right? Our effort here has been to really focus on what can we do in advance of an event happening? How can we buy down the impacts of that event? And we, and we do this in various verticals, right? In wildfire, you know, we have uh, established and, and really amplified technology to be able to do everything from um, predictive analysis, uh, looking at all the high risk areas of the state, uh, being able to forecast the potential for fire spread or fire start. We have uh, leveraged uh, capabilities like uh, satellite technology. We've leveraged uh, partnerships with the Department of Defense through our California National Guard to be able to use uh, DOD satellites um, to be able to pinpoint uh, hotspots that, that we may not see typically, but you could see it through satellite uh, and give us an ability to, um, to identify where that is and respond to it rapidly to be able to extinguish it. We set a metric to keep all fires at 10 acres or less to try to minimize the amount of impact to the communities uh, that we've seen year in and year out. Um, we have built in a um, capability where we've got surveillance aircraft that are flying over that can rapidly uh, downlink uh, to responding incident commanders or, or fire strike teams uh, at the local level and see it on their smartphones or you know, in real time on their tablets where the, what the fire perimeter looks like, how fast it's spreading, what is the community that could be potentially impacted. Um, and then that then rolls into the ability to, uh, you know, um, more uh, accurately and uh, rapidly determine how we would do evacuations or we would place resources in a much more effective and, um, and coordinated way. Uh, but we've also built in a new capability. Um, and if you think about it from this context, on the East Coast, when hurricanes are coming, with the National Hurricane Center uh, is, is tracking potential storm development five or six days out. And as that storm you know, develops, they're, um, they're, they're making predictions of where that landfall is going to take place. And then they can warn the public um, and local and state and, and federal resources and the private sector and citizens themselves can then act accordingly to be able to to respond to that so i was thinking through that took a page out of that to say what can we do in the context of wildfire in california where we can actually uh use technology to see fire weather evolving four and five days out in advance right um working with our national weather service uh, working with our state meteorologists. And, and so we built a, a, a center, it's a joint center, uh, much like uh, not at the level of the National Hurricane Center, but certainly for what we need, um, uh, a joint center with our California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, the US Forest Service, the National Weather Service, uh, our National Guard, uh, my office, to be able to, to build this center uh, and, and leverage all of the, the weather technology to make uh, an advanced determination as to uh, where the fire weather is going to be most impactful, what counties, down to what communities. And then we lay that over with um, high intensity fire map areas map that we've done throughout the state. And when we know where red flag conditions are going to be uh, as a result of that, we can actually pre-position fire strike teams in advance of the fire breaking out. And we just put them in an area, the highest risk area. And should a fire break out, those those pre-positioned assets are immediately on the scene uh, to able to extinguish the fire or assist with evacuations. Or if the conditions are so great, we may want to do a pre-evacuation to get people out of harm's way so that the firefighters can, can focus on firefighting, right? All of this in a coordinated fashion. So in the, in the case of technology, through situational awareness, or through, uh, through other means, uh, we've, we've, leveled, we've increased the level at which we can share that information. And it has to be something that, that is shared up and down between local government, state government, and all of our partners, and then ultimately articulated to the public. And um, that expansion has been um, really something that continued to evolve over the last few years and has been very, very successful. And, and we continue to learn and, and grow from that. And, and all of us are participating in it. Um, uh, but it doesn't come without uh, an infrastructure. Uh, we've needed to also expand our public safety communications capability, um, uh, increasing our interoperability 
capability. Um, we expanded our and enhanced our, our 911 system where, where all of these things sort of start from, right? People calling 911, but we wanted to have resiliency in that. But we also work with our telecommunications partners, uh, both at the utilities, uh, electrical utilities, as well as telecoms to build in resiliency in their systems so that they would have, and we could count on uh, those systems being operational and, uh, and sustainable uh, through these, these various kinds of events. <clears throat> so this has really been a, a, a all hands on deck uh, approach over the last uh, several years. Um, and, um, and, it, and it's proven to be um, phenomenal. Um, we've also done some innovative things working with our utilities, like uh, utilities which um, have had you know, an infrastructure that's older where we would have power lines drop and start fires. Um, we've done some very controversial, innovative, um, possibly things that uh, where utilities, you know, utilizing the same data that I talked about, about what we would see in our wildfire forecasting center, our national hurricane center format, um, and being able to anticipate of possibly turning the power off in certain key areas that were going to be high risk fire zones, right? It's called public safety power shutoff. And, and so working with local governments, working with the community-based organizations, uh, pu uh, publicly announcing through the community um, and getting people to understand that uh, turning the power off is actually a mitigation measure to be able to buy down the risk of wildfire. And, uh, and you know, at first it was very controversial and very difficult. And the state, you know, my office, we, we pushed out grants um, we work a lot with communities of access and functional needs and representatives throughout uh, community-based organizations to build capacity for those who were most vulnerable uh, to be able to have resources to um, make sure they withstood the time period uh, that the power would be off. And we work with the utilities through our Public Utilities Commission to ensure that the power would be off for the minimal amount of time. Uh, at the same time, working with them to build microgrids and be able to carve out key areas like 911 centers and hospitals and other critical infrastructure that we did not want the power turned off to um, uh, through this process. And that has continued to evolve and expand and, and has really been a, a phenomenal, um, I think, success uh, over the, in the long run. Um, of course, uh, all of this has been, uh, and I've been talking about a lot with the response operations. Uh, when you think about all of this, you know, it's that you can't necessarily firefight your way out of all these wildfires or, you know, or, or through the earthquake, we have to do mitigation. Uh, we have to spend a lot of time in our principles about building capacity um, and resiliency. And so we have implemented programs across the board, starting with um, uh, equity uh, and, uh, and inclusion within emergency management programs. Uh, these, these programs really, you know, all programs now, all response, all recovery, all mitigation grants uh, and other grants that we do here um, are, um, are uh, framed through the lens of equity uh, and fairness. We know that there are, there are disadvantaged communities and, and individuals that they get hit by these disasters. Uh, they are disproportionately impacted by these events and, and we want to make sure that, um, that there's enough resources and, and the right resources to be able to address those and really want to do that on the front end to again, build resiliency into their capacity and then help them navigate through that during the major disaster event and then through the recovery process. We have unfortunately lost a lot of communities, particularly in our Sierra front uh, areas where every year we've lost whole towns. This last this year alone, we, we lost two additional uh, communities in, in far Northern California. And, and while they're small communities, they're the entire community gets lost and it is catastrophic for these Folks, and so we've had to learn to work uh, and 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 take the emergency management principles to another level, a different level, leaning forward, um, uh, leveraging all of the capabilities and resources that the state, uh, the locals, uh, and our federal government have, um, uh, leveraging our mutual aid systems, which we have very extensive and and um, and uh, longstanding mutual aid uh, capabilities. But it's not just public mutual aid, it's leveraging our private sector partners. One thing I did when I came here is, is establish the Office of Public, Private and, and Non-Governmental Coordination uh, within the Executive Office of the Director. And that was really to leverage all of our private sector partners. We have such enriched capabilities in California 
um, whether it's in the tech industry or the groceries industry or transportation, they need to be a partner with us. And so we work to bring them into our state operations center. They're sitting at the table with us during um, emergencies as a, as a, a partner. Um, and we move forward together in the overall planning. And so it's really leveraging the whole of community in our ability to effectively respond to uh, and then recover from these events. Um, and, the, and, the, and, you know, going through response, I mean, these responses can be very complicated, um, notwithstanding that you have one kind of threat you're dealing with a wildfire, but when you're dealing with a wildfire during a massive pandemic, during, you know, a civil unrest all happening at the same time, uh, and, oh, we could have, you know, something like a, an earthquake jump in there as well. Um, you have to be able to effectively utilize principles uh, of, of, of coordination, um, coordination being a, what I would say, an under, understood and underestimated importance in the, the overall role of emergency management and bringing all these agencies and capabilities together, but having a set of priorities and objectives and metrics uh, that are utilized, that are, that are coordinated at the highest level. So uh, here in, in, in California, we have a unified coordination group that gets established at the highest level uh, with the governor and the governor's cabinet, key, key cabinet agencies that have a response or recovery role um, and um, coordinated by uh, and facilitated by myself, um, utilizing the authorities that are vested in our Emergency Services Act, which is very, very powerful. Um, to be able to leverage all of government, uh, local, state, uh, and then coordinate with our federal partners to be able to respond to all of these events. And so that unified coordination group um, uh, is making decisions based upon the action plans that come in. So from the local uh, incident level, that information gets pushed up to the state operations center, which develops an overarching incident action plan, uh, which comes up to the unified coordination group. And we're looking at at all of that data in, um, in an operational period and making uh, decisions that need to be uh, made, the prioritizing how the state would respond, and how they would leverage to be able to stay out in front of these. And that's where all of these different things are adjudicated um, and effectively managed. And then we work on a, um, a, a communications package for public education, public information, uh, crisis communications uh, in a timely way to keep the public informed of what we're doing. And so, you know, we're, we're continuing learning. Uh, we're continually having to uh, pivot to uh, meet the, um, the impacts and the challenges that we face. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the reality is, is that all of this has significantly changed um, from when I first got here. Uh, and, um, and, you know, um, it's been um, sort of a, a fire hose, I guess you could say, of, of incidents and events. Um, we've had you know, major terrorist attacks in the state during my tenure. We've had uh, obviously biohazards, major hazards, material spills, oil spills off the coast of California in highly sensitive. I mean, it's not withstanding you have an oil spill off of the coast of California, but these oil spills are happening in the highly sensitive um, environmental areas of the state and, and having that major impact. And, uh, you know, um, cybersecurity events, uh, all of these have caused us to work with our legislature and our governors to build capability. Uh, I mentioned the Wildfire Intelligence Center. Uh, we have a new uh, fire uh, intelligence aircraft, which really an all hazard aircraft to, to get real time downlink uh, information, situational awareness. We have situational awareness tools. We use a lot of data analytics that we've never used before uh, to help us make decisions um, and, uh, and, and artificial intelligence capabilities. Uh, to be able to make us um, make the, the appropriate decision and really to stay out in front of the evolving crisis. Hopefully we can mitigate on the front end. Um, then it starts way, way in advance. We, we work a lot with our communities to identify risks and gaps. And then we push a lot of grants out and we have metrics with regards to uh, building um, uh, adequate mitigation and, and resiliency uh, throughout the state. Uh, we have programs uh, that are focused on disenfranchised, dif disenfranchised and underserved communities like Listos, California. Listos is a, a Spanish word for prepared, and it's targeted for, you know, uh, demographics within the state that uh, typically are afraid of government or um, don't, don't 
come to government for assistance, right? But but many of them need it the most, right? Um, we have Prepared California, which also looks at disadvantaged communities, but it's innovative. It's, it, it's, it's leveraging state dollars to make the match of federal dollars um, for uh, hazard mitigation programs, right? To build those resiliency. Many times underserved communities don't have the resources or the funding to be able to, um, to uh, effectively uh, do a mitigation grant. But through this program, um, we can work with those communities to ensure that they can in fact build the capacity uh, within their community. We are doing innovative things like home hardening and community hardening, where we go in and whether it's seismic retrofits in large swaths uh, um, of, uh, of areas that have high seismic activity where we can go in and actually retrofit homes to make sure that they are livable after a quake, which then reduces the amount of impact that we're going to have of housing people after an earthquake. We can get them back into their homes. That's our first and foremost priority, but, um, but also in wildfire and being able to build uh, fire resistance communities and be able to withstand the kind of um, climate related impacts that we're seeing now and that will last for the next 20 or 30 years, you know, un until things change. So we know that this is a marathon, not a sprint, and, and that we have to be, uh, you know, building in those resiliency capabilities over the course of, of the next um, many years. And, uh, um, you know, we've been very, very blessed with a, a, a legislature and, and a governor, both governors that I served under, uh, who have been, who get it and understand the complexity of the threat to California um, and, um, and and understand climate related impacts and how that has cascading um, uh, consequences throughout the state. So from the mitigation standpoint and preparedness up through um, our response uh, and then into the recovery, right? We're doing innovative things, everything from debris management, debris removal. Um, we're, we have metrics that rapidly remove debris, uh, identify all the hazardous waste and hazardous materials uh, teams that will go in. Um, and, um, and again, before 2015, we, we had none of these programs, right? So we have had to learn uh, in the last 10 years how to build a massive uh, debris management program, the ability to effectively go in and, and clear um, lots of, of fire debris, or earthquake debris, uh, get those, those, that community um, clean and clear, certify that they're ready to be rebuilt on, and then work with them on, on rebuilding, right? Uh, and in some cases, it's actually restructuring the way that, that the community is designed. Some of these communities were designed um, uh, you know, years ago in the 50s and 60s uh, that, that didn't take into account the kind of conditions that we're facing today. So this gives us an opportunity to start fresh and restructure what a community would look like. And, and we would provide funding for that. We would, we would if it's a federal declare a major disaster declaration, we can work with with, um, with HUD uh, through the, the, the uh, uh, CBD uh, DR program. Uh, we can work with FEMA um, and other agencies, state agencies, state funding uh, to be able to work with those communities to build a more resilient community in, in the future. Um, the key thing is the, the speed at which we move is important. The, the faster we can get the community cleaned up, the faster the community can start to rebuild. And from an economic standpoint, not just for the community itself, but for individuals, that have been impacted. The sooner we can get the community rebuilt, the sooner that um, the, 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 the community can economically recover, the region can recover, and sort of the state can recover. So, you know, when you think about a ones or two events, that's, you know, manageable. But when, you know, I have, I, this summer alone, I've had uh, fires from, from um, the Mexican border in San Diego, all the way up to the Oregon border in Siskiyou, and I've got I've lost communities up and down the state, and um, and in or homes up and down the state, or critical infrastructure. So it all has a cumulative effect, and and we have to think through that as we build um, um, our capabilities to respond to all of this. So emergency management, um, I think you know the old adage of waiting for the phone to ring is far past. This is really all hands on deck. I think emergency managers, it's really important to think they need to think broadly. Um, uh, many, I think I talked to emergency managers that, that, you know, drought's not my problem or uh, pandemic's not my issue, it's health and human services or drought is the Department of Water Resources or whatever. The fact of the matter is emergency management's all of our problems, all of these things are our problems, right? We, 
need to invest and bring the, the, the knowledge space and the ability to coordinate and leverage and convene to be able to get everybody rowing in the same direction to solve a problem, right? We operate under a concept of metrics or incident action planning through objectives and priorities that are time bound. And those time bound um, objectives um, help us to move something very rapidly uh, and, and ultimately get a community um, uh, recovered. Uh, my role, I spend a lot of time uh, during disasters, uh, you know, going into the community, uh, um, having community members hear from me personally. I go once, I go twice, I go 10 times, whatever it takes to be able to build that, that trust in government uh, to ensure that it's not just a, a, an empty promise that we're responding, but that we're there from the beginning through the middle to the end. And we embed folks um, uh, in these communities uh, throughout the, the course of the life cycle of the disaster from beginning to end to ensure that all of those expectations are met. Uh, this, this is something that is a one team, one fight. Um, there is no uh, Republican, Democrat. This is just people. And um, I think disaster management, you know, I, I do know and cognizant of the fact that all disasters are political events. But I also understand that the way you approach that uh, can be um, that, you know, it's a people first issue. And uh, whether it's underserved or, or wealthy folks in, in affluent communities, everybody's going to get uh, um, the resources and support they need. Um, so I'll kind of wrap it up there. I, I just would say that the last uh, uh, 12 years or so since I've been here, um, I don't know what happened, but uh, there's been, it's just been <laughs> crazy. And uh, um, I've had, uh, you know, I've had a, a, a team of people who understand that, you know, I, I lead an organization of unbelievably talented people. Uh, and and, and um, uh, they just do phenomenal work. And they always, always step up to the plate. Um, while everybody was at home, uh, they, uh, during the pandemic, this place was operational. In fact, the entire state government shut down, the executive branch, the governor and the governor's senior staff moved in here for several months at the State Operations Center, part of our continuity of government plan. Uh, and and, and the, the, the teams all came in and they worked their butt off. And they did that while also managing multiple other uh, events. I cannot speak uh, more about these folks. I'm so proud of them. And, uh, and I'm proud of people in emergency management overall. I mean, look, we, we, there's always a lot of focus and you know, we are, we all won. We, OES here in California is unique. We have we have emergency management, we have a fire and rescue, we manage the fire and rescue mutual aid system, we have a law enforcement presence, we do homeland security. Um, I didn't talk much about our, our whole security enterprise, but it's, it's pretty vast. Uh, multiple fusion centers and uh, cybersecurity center that, that, that we manage. All, all of these were evolved as a result of threats and changes and, and, and needs, uh, and then pulled together in a coordinated way. But throughout my tenure, it's been about collaboration, right? I try to make as many task forces. Uh, I try to make as many um, a joint uh, centers where we leverage all of the capabilities of multiple agencies. I feel like we're stronger diversified than we are as one. Um, and so it's the people that really make up the, uh, the organization and, and the ability. Um, so it's really been a, a phenomenal opportunity to serve with them. And, um, and the last 10 years has been, um, has really been something else. So, and I know it's not just here, it's been all over the world, but we've, I think, I think we were sort of early on, uh, we were seeing a lot of that here in California and just from the size and scope and scale of, of California, the impacts that we've seen. Uh, if you think about how diverse California is um, and uh, both from topography, from population um, and, uh, and, and, and the significance California has to the rest of the world, um, it was really important to continue to stay out in front of these and build a very, very robust uh, emergency management and continuity uh, program. So with that, I hope that's helpful. I'm happy to answer any questions that you ask. All right. Well, thank you so much um, for a great, uh, for a great, uh, for a great, uh, some wonderful reflections and uh, just a great discussion, so a uh, great conversation so far. Um, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the, the chat that uh, everyone should feel free that has a 
uh, put some questions into the Q&A function uh, and then I can ask them. But while everyone's getting warmed up, I thought maybe I could ask a few questions and then uh, and then I'll and then I'll turn to that. So you gave us like a, a, just a ton of, um, I don't know, so much uh, innovation going on in California and, and uh, so much you, you've accomplished and, and worked on over the past few years. I thought maybe I could turn the directions and start with like a softball question and just ask you a little bit to talk a little bit about like what 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 brought you to emergency management? How did you get started in the field? Um, and what what how is it? I don't know how how, how have you felt about your career? What's been most surprising uh, with all this all this experience you've had in, in this discipline? That's a great question. I I you know it's funny because I um, at a very young age I I was very you know intrigued by public service. I um, I don't think probably from scouting. Um, and uh, and that whole piece there was uh, I, I was intrigued by that um, um, young age we I got involved in um, kind of mountain rescue search and rescue and uh, that that sort of was the thing that, that that got me going I think I was just really fascinated by that um, and um, and so um, I I really spent a lot of my time you know even out of high school. Um, getting into the business early on, um, very young, 19, I went to paramedic school and, uh, and, uh, you know, I was very intrigued in the fire service. And, um, along that way, I worked, um, uh, you know, in EMS for a while, uh, and, uh, at the local level was very, um, you know, that cut my teeth a lot on what's happening in, in local communities. I like to go into local communities that were most disadvantaged and, um, um, and it gave me a, a sense of, uh, of you know what was happening in in these communities and and sort of set my my philosophies on things um, and then uh, along the way I decided that I, I probably needed more education so uh, ended up going to the University of California at Davis uh, in the attempt to go to medical school actually and um, um, and along the way you know um, met my soon to be wife and uh, both go to both met at college um, and. I knew folks in uh, through the search and rescue and fire service uh, uh, realm um, here at the OES that asked if you know I'd be interested in uh, coming over to OES. At the time, I was med school bound, uh, but um, there was something significant that happened in 1985, which was the Mexico City earthquake, which was which was catastrophic, and California recognized that they did not have a um, sufficient enough uh, technical and um, you know, advanced search and rescue program for uh, structural collapse after a big earthquake. And all the projections were that we in California were gonna have a, a major, major quake at some point. So they, they said, listen, we wanna develop some sort of a, a advanced capability. Would you be interested in just coming on board and helping us develop that? And at the time I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. So um, I diverted off, finished off college, diverted off on the medical school for a little bit deferred there and then um, came to work for the state uh, to help build what was now known as the National Urban Search and Rescue Response System. So um, that system, uh, of course, is now not nationally, it's also international. Uh, but early on, um, there, there, were, there were only some few capabilities, right? There was some capability in New York, there was some capability uh, in Miami and, uh, and in Virginia, and then we had some capability here in California, but it wasn't an organized um, uh, you know, uh, interagency, multi-agency sort of approach. So I studied a lot uh, across the world, the Brits, the French, you know, Europeans had had a lot of um, advancement on this because of the World War II, and they've gotten lots of capability for dealing with, with structural collapse in, in massive ways. And so I spent a lot of time learning from them, uh, and then ended up coming back and writing uh, a program here in California, um, which, um, uh, ended up on the governor's desk at the time uh, and was asking for some two and a half million dollars to get a program going. I had identified departments uh, at the local level that would work with the state in partnership that would become the first of the urban search and rescue teams. Um, and it sat on the governor's desk for a long time and uh, didn't think it was gonna fly. And then, um, and then the, um, the Loma Prieta earthquake hit San Francisco Bay area. And uh, as you remember, we lost the Cypress structure collapsed and, and uh, we had a lot of fires and building collapses in Santa Cruz and San Francisco. And by the, that evening, the governor signed that into an act and we got funding for the urban search and rescue program. So, um, uh, and so, you know, that was in our fire and rescue division. I, I worked in fire rescue uh, uh, as, you know, one of the chief officers for um, then 
several years. Uh, and that's how I ended up going to uh, Oklahoma City. Um, and, uh, um, you know, because I was on the original um, development of the National Urban Search and Rescue Response System, sat on the, that National Advisory Board for many years, um, I was also one of the incident commanders on that. And so when we went to, when the, the USAR program went to Oklahoma, it was one of the first major deployments to major building collapse. Uh, when we got there, um, you know, um, I was asked to, to serve as the uh, incident commander on the federal uh, USAR response. And so uh, partnered up with uh, Gary Mars at Oklahoma City Fire, and we worked it together uh, to be able to, to respond to that. And you know, that was sort of the, the, the beginning of where we are at with our National Urban Search and Rescue System. I did that for a number of years. And then in, in 97, I, I left the state um, at the request of uh, the time, uh, President Clinton and, and uh, former FEMA director, James Lee Witt. Uh, and I, um, the, the Congress had approved the new program. Uh, it was a new program for 25 um, uh, federal coordinating officers. And there was, uh, and the, these FCOs had a lot of uh, authority to help you know manage disasters around the country, and so um, I left the I left the state and went to work for FEMA um, uh, for a number of years to do that work, and it was it was phenomenal. I still use all of those relationships today, and and the knowledge that I, I gained from that. But I was in disasters across the country, uh, and then came back to the state of California for a few more years through 9/11 um, as the chief deputy director here at OES. Um, uh, and um, kind of navigated the state through the whole 9-11 and the, the, the transfer of, of emergency management to homeland security and all that stuff that went along with that. Um, and then in 2003, um, left the state again to go to the private sector. And I did that for a better part of 10 years. Uh, and we did, uh, I, I actually partnered with James Lee Witt um, and uh, opened this company. We were working all over the world on crisis management. And that gave me a massive um, appreciation and education on worldwide um, challenges and, and what I learned from other countries about emergency management. Um, and uh, I worked a lot in, in Pacific and the Pacific Rim, uh, Asia, China, um, Indonesia, Japan, uh, really learning a lot about what was going on there and brought a lot of that back. And, and then, you know, around 2012 or so, um, the uh, Governor Brown at the time here in California. Uh, asked if I would be, be interested in taking on the role as director. Um, uh, there was some big transitions that were happening. And um, I mean, I couldn't do it at first because I was still working in the private sector, but then, you know, we came to a, a agreement. And, uh, and you know, most people don't know, but um, as soon as uh, um, we agreed to that, shortly after I, I got diagnosed with, a, with, uh, with cancer and, and uh, was, uh, was pretty advanced, and um, it was in my throat. And, uh, um, and so I talked to the governor and basically told him I, I probably couldn't do the job because he needed somebody strong to get through that. And I didn't know if I was going to survive this. And uh, he decided to appoint me that day. Uh, for the first seven or eight months, I was actually um, in a, you know, sick or in a hospital. And uh, you know, they checked on me all the time. And, and really, we, we, we worked it from that angle. Uh, and then as soon as I could get back up on my feet, thank God, um, we hit the ground running. My first thing was responding to a wildfire in Northern California up in Shasta uh, County. And uh, I remember uh, a week before that, I was in a hospital bed and then I was there up in Shasta County at a wildfire and it sort of never stopped since then. I've just been at it and uh, focused uh, in this role. And it's just been I mean, you know, that's sort of a high level summary, but it's just been a phenomenal career. Um, and uh, it sort of drove me into this whole emergency management realm. But all of the experiences from local government to private sector, to state government, the federal government, to international, all of those are all pieces that, that help, I think, you know, build my, my career and, and my understanding and my interpretation of of how the, to respond and, and build an organization. So it's been, um, it's been just fantastic, really. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, um, let me turn to uh, some audience questions now. Um, so Zach Smith was a 
asks a little bit about coordination. So one of the things you talked, you spent a good amount of time kind of talking about was how this change that you've seen in emergency management, where it's turned into this kind of one team effort with the federal, state, and locals kind of trying to work together in a way that, that's maybe a little bit different. Um, I'd love to hear you kind of talk a little more about that. What are the what are the big challenges that you've seen? What needs to be fixed? You know, we we work a lot with DHS and FEMA, and so we're always kind of trying to understand the dynamic there and, and, and ways that we can kind of help out and make things better. I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Well, I, I still think even though, um, you know, we've had lots of uh, events uh, that should be driving us more, I still think we have a, we did, we need to do more with information sharing and, and, uh, and this sort of collaborative effort. I, I think the natural progression, the human progression, natural human inclination is to go back to our respective stovepipes, to go to our respective um, corners uh, and not necessarily be willing to share information or, you know, uh, the people like a structure. And I think structure is important, don't get me wrong, but I, th I think in this case, um, you know, uh, emergency management, even, even on the adva uh, advance of uh, events, like during the mitigation and preparedness phase, Sharing information and, um, and, and capabilities only builds a broader uh, ability to prepare for and respond to and recover, right? Um, now, you can do that by, by still understanding that, you know, there are statutory authorities and regulations that exist at the various levels of government. But I've always been of the mind, don't, I don't want to get caught up to the point that it's an impediment to respond to a life-saving event or to prepare for a life-saving event, right? So we have something here, um, California put in place after a catastrophic event, the, the 92 fires, I think it was 92 or 91 in the Oakland Hills, it was a firestorm, burned down 3,800 homes, something like that. Uh, and um, as a result of that, we, we implemented uh, in statutory, statutory authority um, the standardized emergency management system. So SEMS, as we call it, um, was the precursor to NIMS. And uh, the system, you know, outlines how every level of government will coordinate, share information, stops, starts at the bottom, uh, um, as far as uh, city government to an operational area or county, county to the region, region to the state, state to the federal, um, all, all all political subdivisions of California, in other words, all cities, county, special districts, et cetera, participate by regulation in this system. It's a phenomenal system. It keeps us all on the same page. It helps us to all work in the same direction, but it can also be an impediment in that, well, you know, the, the city didn't go to the county appropriately, didn't go to the state appropriately, or the state came down from the state level to the local level. And I think that, um, you know, the one thing to learn, particularly from these fast moving events that we're seeing that are, that are starting, they evolve rapidly and they have an immediate and rapid impact to people's lives and property that sometimes you have to not approach things super linearly. You have to, it's not a linear response. It's an all, it's an asymmetric event that, that, that takes a, a different requirement of different approach different coordination, different information sharing. So if on the front end of these events, you are collaborating together, if on the front end of these events, you're testing, training, um, educating, but you use the concepts of incident command, use the concept of SEM, use the concepts of NIMS to be able to effectively respond. Um, and uh, uh, that's really important because I think that a lot of times people, um, notwithstanding, um, just the need to want to stay in their structure. Um, structure is important, don't get me wrong. And you want to operate within a structure to the degree possible, but you also understand that these are guidelines and concepts that, um, that you need to, to leverage to help you stay organized and effective. But that the incidents you're facing, they're not looking at that. They're not looking at jurisdictional boundaries. They're not looking at um, you know, it, it, you know, who is getting impacted and who's not. They're not looking at the speed at which they're spreading. You know, all those are happening in real time, right? And so um, this has been, I think, a big, um, somewhat controversial, I guess, to some degree uh, uh, with me here in, in California. But, um, you know, uh, I believe that, the, that our standardized system is critical. And I think it is uh, it's foundational to everything that we do. 
but I also understand that, that it, it's a concept, it's a guideline that we operate from uh, to be able to, um, to all effectively respond. So that's probably the, I would say the biggest thing um, that I've seen a change. Um, the, the other big ch change I've seen is, is, uh, is really understanding um, the impacts, you know, so, so all disasters are local events, right? They, they start and end in, in a local community. So many, so many parts of the state are impacted by a disaster. I don't care how you look at it uh, economically and, and et cetera, but, but it really does affect a community, right? So it's where people live and go to church and go to school and, and, and their livelihoods. So it's really important to understand what's happening in the community, right? We need to understand the equity um, and, uh, and, and we need to be able to address and get down into the, the, the deepest reaches of a community and make sure that, those, that all those folks are effectively being cared for. That was never more evident during, than during the pandemic, right? We, you know, and in here we have a situation where not just, you know, it's not just one community that's being impacted by a disaster, but it's the entire state's entire world, right? And it's all of us. It's not just the, the people that we're responding for, but it's us ourselves that are in, in this disaster. It's our families that are in this disaster, right? So we have to think uh, about how we're going to respond to this, right? And it is both bottom up and top down. It's sideways uh, to be able to effectively uh, respond to these to this event. And uh, and so I mean I think emergency management really really took a, a major step forward in in the evolutionary process in the pandemic because you know there were so many different agencies that had authorities, but they uh, they were authorities under their respective vertical, the respective pipeline, right? Or stovepipe. And emergency management was able to be able to take all of those, um, those entities and bring them under an umbrella to have an effective state response to these, whether it was for commodity management or acquisition or resource allocation uh, or logistics support um, or vaccinations or, or feeding people who were shuttings. Uh, seniors and people with access and functional needs that, that did not have the ability to get out or had no one to go to, right? To be able to reach all those to people who are homeless that were going to be affected by um, uh, uh, COVID, but had no place to go, right? And being able to build a, a capacity for that. All of those were, were innovative and complex thinking uh, that were based upon, um, I think what emergency management does is looks at the complexity of a situation and they're solution oriented to, to be able to find the best resource, the best solution um, and, and leverage the best capability to be able to achieve what objectives you're, you're trying to get to. So uh, that's kind of the, the, some of those, those areas I think that still, you know, we, we need to stay at it. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things that come at us, directions that come at us that, uh, that uh, we could lose sight of that but we, we do need to make sure that we continue to uh, information share, collaborate, um, and uh, understand that, um, you know, uh, one size does not fit all. So we have to really think through that. Thank you. Well, that was, thank you very much. That's very interesting. Um, kind of building on that, one of my, one of my colleagues, uh, Paul Brenner, asked a question about partnerships with the private sector. Um, and so he, he kind of notes that, uh, he noted that, you know, California is known for having good partnerships with electric utilities. And was kind of curious about the involvement of partnerships with the insurance industry and kind of the role that, that to the extent that they are involved uh, in this kind of world and these activities. Well, we, we actually have a very robust um, partnership with a number of private sector uh, areas. And, and um, I mean, it's phenomenal the, what, what, you know, the private sector has just a massive amount of capabilities and they have a lot of interest in providing support during disasters, it, but they don't know how to plug into the system and they don't know how to leverage their resources in the best, most effective way. And that's one thing that we can really do here in government is be able to provide a pathway for them. Uh, in the case of insurance, uh, in the case of, you know, it's unique here, I we have a uh, organization called the California Earthquake Authority. It's, it's in essence the, the state's earthquake insurance program. It's an insurance agency. I chair the board of directors for that. Um, uh, it's given us an uh, uh, opportunity to uh, engage 
more broadly with uh, the insurance industry. We have um, uh, insurance commissioner's office, which is a constitutional office within the state. Um, I spend time with the insurance commissioner and our folks. Uh, when we now respond to a disaster, um, work with uh, members of the insurance commissioner's office, and then we try to work with um, um, the various insurance providers. Um, I have many times brought them around a round table uh, to talk about things like uh, uh, preparedness and planning on the front end of the disaster, how we can work to uh, buy down the risk. For example, if we harden a community, for example, to against wildfire, um, or we can work to seismically retrofit a home, can um, the industry provide um, discounts to individuals on their insurance premiums uh, or in a case where the insurance may not necessarily want to provide insurance, if we work to provide mitigation into those areas and build a more resilient community, will the insurance industry reevaluate and step in and provide insurance to those communities? So there's a number of things that we do uh, with the insurance industry. And, you know, they, they have, you know, they have been pretty good partners. I mean, they are working to try to find um, ways to be solution oriented. Um, and, uh, you know, at times, uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. I mean, there's, there's, there's challenges sometimes when, when, um, you know, we, we want, we want them to be a little bit more uh, proactive. Uh, but we also understand where they're coming from. And that's part of that partnership and that relationship. The more we know about each other, the, the more we can understand what they can and cannot do. And then we can leverage those pieces that um, that we know that they can be partnering with us on. So um, I think that's an ever evolving area. There's more work to be done in that area, uh, but I'm, I'm, I see it promising and it's been you know, getting better and better as the years have gone on. Well, thank you. Well, we're coming up on the hour. So let me just ask maybe one last question that we can close on and then, uh, uh, and then kind of let you go for the day. Um, so one of the things that's just particularly fascinating about California and listening to you talk is just the sheer breadth of challenges you have to deal with, uh, just in terms of the different kinds of natural hazards and, and threats uh, you have to deal with. And then just the, I mean, California is such a socio, uh, such a diverse state. Um, I'd love to hear like, you know, how did you, did you, did you institute or take, uh, take part in kind of policies to kind of get ahead of things? Like to, what's the not, think about identified novel threats that you're worried about or things that aren't typically on the, or aren't on your radar? Did you kind of, Kind of make that a regular part of your of your process to to kind of think it, to kind of try to get ahead of what the next the next big worry is. We do. I mean, uh, I'll I'll say yes, we do, um, and uh, uh, we actually have to because um, you know it, it. I I I'm 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 all about not wanting to be late to need. Um, I I want to try to anticipate as much as we possibly can. So, um, you know. I mentioned what we've done on pre-positioning based upon what the potential threats are going to be in the seismic area. You know, we have, we have, you know worked with the legislature, the governor, and invested into uh, the nation's first earthquake early warning system. Right, we have put sensors up and down the state of California um, that are designed to sense the hypocenter of an earthquake, not just the epicenter, but the hypocenter, so it's deep in the ground. Um, and before the energy is emitted up to shaking level, um, these sensors sense that, that there is going to be an earthquake coming and we can push out a warning to people on their, on their smartphones via an app um, uh, that uh, will tell them that uh, within up to 90 seconds, earth, the, earth, you know, the shaking is going to begin. So drop, cover and hold, stop your car, uh, but it's, it's, it, you know, get into a safe zone but it's really impactful in industry, right? If you think about if you're an eye surgeon and you're about to do a procedure and you get a warning that an earthquake is coming, right? You can stop that procedure or firehouse doors can, can roll up automatically or school alarms can go off, kids can get under, under things or train stops automatically so that it doesn't get derailed. All of these things are all preventative things that we've implemented here and thought through on the front end. Um, uh, our security side of things, we're constantly uh, evaluating risks and threats, constantly critical infrastructure, threats to critical infrastructure. 
foreign adversaries, now domestic adversaries, which are much more broader and, and uh, more prevalent in today's day and age, right? Um, security threats to our election, uh, to our energy grid. Um, we're anticipating a lot what's happening with our energy grid as we move from, from an, a, a traditional energy distribution system to renewables, right? And what does that mean in the long run if, if we have uh, major disasters and, you know, we, we, how do we ensure that the lights stay on? How do we ensure that we have uh, capacity and capability um, as we move off of traditional systems into new innovative systems? Um, uh, th these are phenomenal meetings that we have and discussions we have and collaborative so much and we invest our, our universities and, and you know, um, folks that are thinking through this in a broader way. Um, in the same time, we're doing that while we're facing, you know, constant actual responses to emergencies, um, which never seem to slow down here. So it's really kind of a balance. Um, my big challenge is, is I have a, a workforce that is tired. You know, they're, they're, they're working at things all the time. And I want them to think, you know, like, what, what are you thinking about in a broad sense? What are you thinking about outside of the response? But what are, the, are these other things we're talking about here? And sometimes, you know, it's hard to, to, to do that while you're, while you're, you know, flying the plane about what is it going to be like, you know, to build a new plane. So um, all of that is a factor, but um, think tanks. And uh, I was just on a call this morning, which was phenomenal about, um, about um, you know, black, what we call black sky events, loss of, of the power grid, uh, the ability to effectively um, have communications and address the needs. I was last week in Northern Command in Colorado, where I was getting briefed on some DOD aspects on uh, ways to repower the grid. So there's a lot of uh, work that's done in this. And I think it's very, very important because um, you, you have to stay out, not just one or two, but maybe five steps out in front of what the next threat's going to be and, and really anticipate that. Thank you very much. Um, well, we've, we've reached two o'clock. Um, I just want to thank you, Dr. Gologucci, for your time and, and on your insight. This has been a great conversation and we really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Um, all right. Well, have a, have a good afternoon. Right. Thank okay. you, everybody, for, uh, for joining in the great questions. Buddy, God bless. Thank you.